Welcome back to our Time of the End series, where we will speak about the events of the last days. Now, we already had a long journey behind us, and there are just a few steps more to go. So, the chapter we want to speak now about called the Restoration. So, we are, when we look back to our timeline and we have a look what happened already, we will now figure out that we are at a point when the second coming has happened. So, Jesus has come, and now the first resurrection, so the resurrection of life, was there, and all the saints from all the ages, they now came up. And now, what happened now? Now they are alive. So we know that they ascend and they will meet Jesus in the air. But how does it go on? And this is what we will figure out now. So let us start with a word of prayer and then go deep into our study. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that we are allowed to study your word. Please help us and open our eyes and hearts for your message. Please help us to understand what will happen in the near future, that we may be prepared for these days. Thank you so much. In the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. So when we go through our timeline, second coming is there is a time afterwards now we call is the millennium. So millennium means a thousand. Why? Because there are a thousand years now. So there's a thousand year time spawn. And so you can clearly see that the measure here is not steady. So some, sometimes, like the millennium, is extremely long, we have thousand years. And for example, the great time of trouble is a very, very short time. So now let's have a look, have a look what will happen in, the, in this millennium time. So how will it look like? What will we do there? And what happened on earth and in heaven? So we have a look at first to the quotation here from Ellen White, we find in early writings, page 287. Here it said, the earth mightily shook, and the voice of the Son of God called forth his sleeping saints. They responded to the call and came forth clothed with glorious immortality, crying, Victory, victory over death and the grave. O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? Then the living saints and the risen ones raised their voices in a long, transporting shout of victory. What we read here is the resurrection. And now, it says in early writings, page 287, those bodies that had gone down into the grave bearing the marks of disease and death come up in immortal health and vigor. The living saints are changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, and caught up with the risen ones, and together they meet their Lord in the air. Oh, what a glorious meeting! Friends, whom death has separated, were united, never more to part. We all entered the cloud together and were seven days ascending to the sea of glass. So now there will be a movement. We will move from earth to heaven. And this takes seven days, as Ellen White says here. So a seven day journey from earth to heaven. And what will we do there? What will we do in heaven? Let's have a look. It says in early writings, 287, And the saint in the cloud cried, Glory, Alleluia! And the chariot rolled upward to the holy city. Before entering the city, the saints were arranged in a perfect square, with Jesus in the midst. He stood head and shoulders above the saints and above the angels. His majestic form and lovely countenance could be seen by all in the square. So, when the cloud moved upwards now, and they moved to the holy city, they will not enter the holy city, but they will be in front of the gates of the city, and Jesus will place them in a square. So, all the saints now, they build a big square in front of the city, without entering the city. What does Jesus want to do? Why are the saints waiting there in front of the city and not enter the city? Well, let's have a look what we can read here, why Jesus let the saints wait outside. It says in early writings 288, Then I saw a very great number of angels bring from the city glorious crowns. 
a crown for every saint, with his name written thereon. As Jesus called for the crowns, angels presented them to him. And with his own right hand, the lovely Jesus placed the crowns on the heads of the saints. Now Jesus just lets the people wait outside because he wants to place the crowns on their heads by his own hand. Can you imagine this? Can you believe? I mean, why do you receive the crown of life? Because of Jesus. Because Jesus has given his life for you. Because Jesus has changed your heart. Because Jesus has done everything for you that you need to enter to eternity. So all that happened was Jesus. And I will be there in heaven just because of the relationship that I had to Jesus. But Jesus will not let us enter the city before giving us a crown of life. And he wants to do it with our own lovely hand. Isn't this amazing? And afterwards, we will then go into the city. But before we will enter the city now, we will bring our look back to the earth. So what happened on earth when now the saints are all gone? Let's turn back and have a look to the earth. In Revelation 20, verse 1, we read, Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, having the key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. So this, while Jesus is coming, so on the second coming, there's another angel coming with him. And he has a key to the bottomless pit and a chain in his hand. So what will he do with it? It says here in Revelation 20, verse 2 and 3, He laid hold on the dragon, the serpent of old, who is a devil and Satan, and bound him for a thousand years. And he cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should deceive the nations no more till the thousand years were finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. So now these angels, this angel, he will now cast Satan into the bottomless pit and shut up over him. So what does it mean? Now, when we think about Satan, he was a great deceiver. He deceived the nations. But now, whom to deceive? I mean, all the saints, they are gone with Jesus into heaven. So all the other people, the wicked, they are all dead. Because they died when Jesus was coming. They said, mountains fall, fall upon us, that we may not see the face of the one who is coming in the clouds. So they were all dead. The righteous are all in heaven. So Satan cannot deceive anyone now. And so he is bounded. He's bounded by circumstances. And this on the earth. So he cannot left this planet. How does the world look like now in the time when just Satan is here and all the saints are gone to heaven? We'll read in Jeremiah 4, 23 till 26. I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and void. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and all the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was no man, and all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness, and all its cities were broken down at the presence of the Lord by his fierce anger. So what he sees now is the destruction of the world. Everything is upside down. Everything is destroyed. The cities are gone. Even the mountains has collapsed. The islands were shaking. And he could not see any man. He could not see even the birds. He couldn't see anything. All the fruitful places has turned into wilderness. Every single city, every village, every town is destroyed in this time. And what about the humans? Where are they? Well, it says here in Jeremiah 25, verse 33, And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented or gathered or buried. They shall become refuse on the ground. Wow, this sounds terrible. 
a lot of dead people and no one will bury them? Why? Why will they not bury the dead? Well, they cannot. No one is there to bury them. Think about it. All the righteous are gone with Jesus into heaven. And all the other, the wicked, they are all dead. Nobody can bury them. Of course not. So all the slain people, they lay everywhere where they have fallen. They lay in the streets, in the cities, in the destroyed towns and in the villages. This is a very, very special moment and a very sad view that Jeremiah had here to see the, the earth in this state. In early writings, 290, Ellen White says, The earth looked like a desolate wilderness. Cities and villages, shaken down by the earthquake, lay in heaps. Mountains had been moved out of their places, leaving large caverns. Ragged rocks thrown out by the sea or torn out of the earth itself were scattered all over its surface. Large trees had been uprooted and were strewn over the land. So it looks terrible, the surface of this planet. Everything is destroyed. Then she said, Here is to be the home of Satan with his evil angels for a thousand years. Here he will be confined to wander up and down over the broken surface of the earth and see the effects of his rebellion against God's law. For a thousand years he can enjoy the fruit of the curse which he has caused. Limited alone to the earth, he will not have the privilege of ranging to other planets to tempt and annoy those who have not fallen. So literally, the Satan and his angels, they are bound to this planet. They cannot do anything. On this planet, all the living creatures are dead. The only one who is left over is Satan and his evil angels. All the saints are gone with Jesus into heaven. In the early writings 290, it goes on and says, During this time, Satan suffers extremely. Since his fall, his evil traits have been in constant exercise. But he is then to be deprived of his power and left to reflect upon the part which he has acted since his fall and to look forward with trembling and terror to the dreadful future when he must suffer for all the evil that he has done and be punished for all the sins that he has caused to be committed. So this would be a very, very sad time for the Satan. He was a great deceiver. He was a man murderer. He is the one who is destroying the earth right now. But one day, a thousand years, this destroyed earth will be his home. He will live here. and He cannot leave the planet. He cannot do anything else. He's just here. And no one there to deceive. He's bounded for a thousand years. Well, let's go back to our timeline. So, the first thing that we see in the millennium is that the Satan is bounded on the earth. He cannot leave this planet. Now, this was a view to the earth. Now we want to have a look to heaven. What will happen to the, with the saints in, he, in, in heaven? The last things that we have seen were that they have arranged in a great square in front of the gates of Jerusalem. And there it was when Jesus has placed the crowns on their heads. Let's go on there and have a look what happened then. Revelation 20, verse 6. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power, but they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall reign with them a thousand years. Revelation 20, verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witnesses to Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast or his image, and had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands. And they lived 
and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. So now it speaks about the saints they have went to heaven. They resurrect, in the first resurrection they went to heaven, and what are they doing now? Judgment is given to them. So they are judges now in a great court. So a thousand years of judgment. Whom will we judge there? What is the judgment about? About us? No. We are already judged. So every case is already cited. I mean the wicked are death on earth and the righteous, they are in heaven now. So what is this judgment for? What will we do there? Let's have a look. Early Writings 290. Then I saw thrones, and Jesus and the redeemed saints sat upon them. And the saints reigned as kings and priests unto God. Christ, in union with his people, judged the wicked dead, comparing their acts with the stature book, the word of God, and deciding every case according to the deeds done in the body. Then they meted out to the wicked the portion which they must suffer, according to their works, and it was written against their names in the book of death. Now there's a book of death mentioned here, and now all the wicked people, they are death on earth already, now there must be a judgment among them. We need to understand, is, is God righteous or is he wrong? Well, God will show in this judgment that he is righteous. And we will see the wicked deeds of all the people they had lived from Adam on. So how did they act? Are they cruel or are they righteous? And we will figure out that God's judgment are all righteous because only the cruel will be condemned. And then there will be a penalty written in the book of death. So what will their penalty be? So this is what we will do in heaven in the thousand years. But let's have a little deeper look how this judgment looks like. Well, when we think about all the special cases that we judge, we will see people in heaven that we are wondering that they are there. For example, if Stephen, the deacon, meets Saul from Tarsus, he would wonder and he would say, why is Saul from Tarsus here? Well, is this a mistake? But then an angel will open a book and will show him, well, have a look here. Have a look to the life of Paul. And Stephen would be very happy that he was allowed to die as a testimony for Saul of Tarsus, who became Paul later. And so we will meet a lot of people there and we will be happy among everybody who we meet. But there will be some sad cases as well, because we will miss a lot of people where we were very sure that they will meet them in heaven. What about the brethren in our church? People where we are very sure that they need to be in heaven, because they have dedicated their life to Jesus. But we will figure out in the judgment, some were not honest. And so they were not there. This will be a sad moment. But every case will be open so that we can read everything, so we will see the whole story of the world, from the fall, from Satan and heaven, until the day of judgment. In Education 304 we read, Then will be opened before him the course of the great conflict that had its birth before time began, and that ends only when time shall cease. The history of the inception of sin of fatal falsehood in its crooking working, of truth that, swearing not from its own straight lines, has met and conquered error, all will be made manifest. The veil that interposes between the visible and the invisible world will be drawn aside and wonderful things will be revealed. Now we will see the history of the universe even from the fall of Satan on. Everything will be shown to us that we might understand that God is righteous and that he has tried everything to save angels and humans. So whom will we judge there? 
Well, in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 3, it says, Do you not know that we shall judge angels? Well, of course, angels. I mean, it must be clear to us that the angels were unrighteous, that the rebellion at the throne in heaven was wrong, that the rebellion against God, the Creator, was wrong. And we will see this in the heavenly judgment. In every case, even the life of the angels, which became demons later, will be shown to us. How did they live? Which decisions have they made? And why are they fallen? This will be judged by us, and of course the penalty as well. In early writings, 390, we read, Satan also and his angels were judged by Jesus and the saints. Satan's punishment was to be far greater than that of those whom he had deceived. His suffering would so far exceed theirs as to bear no comparison with it. So even Satan and his wicked angels, so his demons, will be judged by the saints. Their judgments, so their penalty, will be greater because they have deceived more people. So this is a very fair and righteous and faithful judgment. In Revelation 21 verse 2 we can see what will, have, what will happen after the thousand years. So when the thousand years are over, what will come then? What do we do then? When Revelation 21 verse 2 we read, Then I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Well, now John, he sees the new Jerusalem coming, the wonderful city of God with all the saints. Now the city is coming down and the city will come down to earth. And White says in early writings, 291, after the judgment of the wicked dead had been finished, at the end of the 1,000 years, Jesus left the city and the saints and a train of the angelic host followed him. Jesus descended upon a great mountain, which as soon as his feet touched it, parted asunder and became a mighty plain. Then we looked up and saw the great and beautiful city with 12 foundations and 12 gates, three on each side, and an angel at each gate. We cried out, the city, the great city, it is coming down from God out of heaven. And it came down in all its splendor and dazzling glory and settled in the mighty plain which Jesus had prepared for it. Now the city is coming. So the city will come down to the earth, but when the city will come to the earth, something more happened. Let's go back to our timeline. Now what we have seen so far now, we have seen the millennium, the thousand years. So, in these thousand years, the Satan will be bound on earth. And in heaven, in heaven, the saints will have a judgment together with Jesus and with the angels. And they will have a look through all the cases of life, through all the de decisions that have been made, and they will see the whole world's history. Now, after the thousand years, then Jerusalem comes. Jerusalem will descend from the heaven and will come down to earth and will settle down on the plains that Jesus has made for it. But when Jerusalem comes down, then something else happened. And this is the second resurrection. So the resurrection of condemnation. When Jerusalem will come down, the wicked will arise. Let's have a look to early writings 292. Then, in terrible, fearful majesty, Jesus called forth the wicked dead. And they came up with the same feeble, sickly bodies that went into the grave. What a spectacle! What a scene! At the first resurrection, all came forth in immortal bloom. But at the second, the marks of the curse are visible on all. 
So the resurrection of the wicked, when the wicked will stand up, their bodies are not glorified. They will stand up as they went into the grave. Revelation 20, verse 7 and 8 says, Now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his prison and will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to battle, whose number is as the sand of the sea. Now when these thousand years are over and the wicked will stand up, now Satan is free, of course, because he can deceive now the people, the wicked, again. And he will do this, and he will gather them. So he will build one big army. What do they want to do? Well, we go back to early writings, 293. Here it says, Then Jesus and the holy angels, accompanied by all the saints, again go to the city, and the bitter lamentations and wailings of the doomed wicked fill the air. Then I saw that Satan again commenced his work. He passed around among subjects and made the weak and feeble strong and told them that he and his angels were powerful. He pointed to the countless millions who had been raised. Well, think about all the people they rose up from death and they see the new Jerusalem there and then they see Satan and the demons. And Satan will make them believe that he was the one who had raised them from death. Since the people would believe Satan. What will Satan do now? He has now an army of wicked people from all over the time and there are small and big ones between. There are people like you and me. So at the very end of the days. And there are people from the very first days of the world before the flood, giants. So all these are now part of Satan's army. In early writings 293, she said, there were mighty warriors and kings who were well skilled in battle and who had conquered kingdoms. And there were mighty giants and valiant men who had never lost a battle. This is the army of Satan. What will Satan do with them? What will he use them for? It says, There was a proud, ambitious Napoleon, whose approach had caused kingdoms to tremble. There stood men of lovely stature and dignified bearing, who had fallen in battle while thirsting to conquer. As they come forth from their graves, they resume the current of their thoughts where it ceased in death. They possess the same desire to conquer which ruled when they fell. So the people, they wake up, they have the desire to conquer something. They have the desire to overtake. And that's what Satan wants to try with them. It says here, Satan consults with his angels and then with those kings and conquerors and mighty men. Then he looks over the vast army and tells them that the company in the city is small and feeble and that they can go up and take it and cast out its inhabitants and possess its riches and glory themselves. The cruel plan of Satan is to overtake the city of New Jerusalem He makes his people know that the new city there is precious and adorable and they want to have it. And the people, they used to conquer things, take over things that do not belong to them. They will freely follow Satan. In Revelation 20, verse 9, in the first part it says, They went up on the breath of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city. So now it looks like an attack. It looks like Satan and his army, they want to conquer the new Jerusalem, so they will surround it. And now they besiege the city. So what will happen then? Early writings, 293. 
Satan succeeds in deceiving them and all immediately begin to prepare themselves for battle. There are many skillful men in that vast army and they construct all kinds of implements of war. Then with Satan at their head, the multitudes move on. Kings and warriors follow close after Satan and the multitude follow after in companies. Each company has its leader and order is observed as they marched over the broken surface of the earth to the holy city. Jesus closes the gates of the city and this vast army surrounded it and placed themselves in battle array, expecting a fierce conflict. Now Jerusalem is completely shut down. The new Jerusalem, the gates are closed and now besieged from all sides. The wicked from all the ages are now alive and together with Satan and his demons they besiege the city. And then it says, Jesus and the angelic host and all the saints with the glittering crowns upon their heads ascend to the top of the wall of the city. Jesus speaks with majesty saying, Behold ye sinners, the reward of the just, and behold my redeemed, the reward of the wicked. The vast multitude beholds a glorious company on the walls of the city. And as they witness the splendor of the glittering crowns and see their faces radiant with glory, reflecting the image of Jesus, and then behold the unsurpassed glory and majesty of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords, their courage fails. Revelation 20, verse 12. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works by the things which were written in the books. So what happens now so far? Well, the city was surrounded and besieged. But when the wicked see now the crowns and the faces of the saints and the face of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, when Jesus was, was standing there in all his glory and the wicked saw him, then the courage think. And now they cannot attack anymore. And now the white throne will ascend above the city. And now God will give a judgment to all the world, to all the wicked. And this is a very interesting moment now in time, when the books were open to everyone, because this situation has been there never before. Think about it. Now there is Jesus, the Father, the Spirit. There are all the saints, the angels. There are all the wicked. There are the demons and there is Satan. So everyone in the universe are now together. Every eye now look to the scene. This has never been before in the whole time. This is a very unique scene now. And now God is speaking the judgment over the wicked. And everybody will understand that his judgment is righteous. But anyway, Satan and his wicked men, they will try to overtake the city. They know that they have been judged and that the judgment of God is righteous. But what will their opinion be? They will attack the city. But God now, he will defend his people and he will fight for them. And it says in Revelation 20, verse 9, the second part, And fire came down from God out of heaven and devoured them. Now God is fighting for his people. The saints don't need to fight anymore. The time of fighting is over, the time of the earth, the time of the rulership of Satan is gone. And now God, he will clean the table now. And so fire will fall from heaven. And the fire, this is what we call this hell fire, the hell fire from heaven. So what happened there? In early writings, 294, it says, Satan rushes into the midst of his followers and tries to stir up the multitude to action. But fire from God out of the heaven is rained upon them. 
and the great men and mighty men, the noble, the poor and miserable are all consumed together. I saw that some were quickly destroyed, while others suffered longer. They were punished according to the deeds done in the body. Some were many days consuming, and just as long as there was a portion of them unconsumed, all the sense of suffering remained. So now this is a judgment. This is a judgment and hell fire. Well, the fire is falling from the sky, falling down on the earth where all the wicked are. And now they are all consumed by the fire. And everybody according to what he has done in the flesh. So everybody has his very own penalty, his very own punishment. So whenever you have deceived someone, you will see him die before you. So you will see what your sin has made, and then you will die. And so some will die very soon, but some will even stay there longer. It says here even for a few days, for many days. Well, and then in Revelation 20, verse 10, in the first part it says, the devil who deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Now, where's the lake of fire? A lake of fire? Well, think about it. The fire fell from the sky to the earth, and it will consume the earth and everything what is on top. So the lake of fire is literally the whole earth. The earth is a lake of fire. If you will have a look from one horizon to the other, you will see only fire. The world looks like a sea of fire. And then it says in Spiritual Gift 3, page 87, When God finally purifies the earth, it will appear like a boundless lake of fire. As God preserved the ark amidst the commotions of the flood, because it contained eight righteous persons, he will preserve the new Jerusalem containing the faithful of all ages. Although the whole earth, with the exception of that portion where the city rests, will be wrapped in a sea of liquid fire, yet the city is preserved, as was the ark, by a miracle of almighty power. It stands unharmed amid the devouring elements. So the New Jerusalem is still on the planet. But the whole planet looks like now a sea of fire. But the city is untouchable. The fire will not harm the city, but the fire will purify the whole planet. And then we go back to Revelation 20 and read verse 14 and 15. Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So in this lake of fire, or in this burning world now, everybody will find his end who has not made a covenant with Jesus. In Revelation 20, verse 10, in the second part it says, and they will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, can it be? Is this fair? Is this possible? Would a righteous God do something like this? to torment them day and night, forever and ever? Well, this would, this would not be fair. God, he hasn't asked you if you want to, to live. He has given you life because he loves you. And as long as you live, you can choose if you want to live eternal life or if you want to die. If you choose to die, it would not be fair from God to say, no, I don't want to let you die. I just give you eternal life, but eternal pain. This would not be fair. God is love. He wouldn't do something like this. So what can it mean? They will be tormented day and night forever and ever. Well, let's go to the book of Jonah to have an idea what it, the eternity means. Jonah 2, verse 6. I went down to the moorings of the mountains. 
the earth with its bars closed behind me forever. Yet you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord my God. Now what we read here is that Jonah, he was the one, he was a prophet who was cast into the Mediterranean Sea. And while he was sinking there, he said, the earth is closed forever. It's closed forever? Well, how long was Jonah in the Mediterranean Sea before he came back to earth or came back to the land? For how long? It was just three days. He said it was forever. But this eternity here means just three days. It's interesting. Let's have another text. For example, here in Jude 7 we read, As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in a similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as an example, suffering the vengeance of eternal fire. Now, when it speaks here about Sodom and Gomorrah, Sodom and Gomorrah, there were two cities and the cities around there, they were punished with eternal fire. Well, let's have a, have a look. Now, if you go to the place where Sodom and Gomorrah and the other cities uh, stood, it is today in the Dead Sea, in the salt area there. But are there still, is there still a burning fire over there? No, it is not. But how can it be? It was an eternal fire. Well, because the course or the result of the fire is eternal. That's why it causes an eternal fire. The result is eternal. So when you have eternal punishment or eternal torment, it means that the result is eternal. Let's have a look to Jeremiah 17, verse 27. God says here, but if you will not heed me to hallow the Sabbath day, such as not carrying a burden when entering the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, then I will kindle a fire in its gates, and it shall devour the places of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. So here God gives a warning to his people and he say, you know, I will ignite a fire among you and it shall not be quenched. So it's an eternal fire in the gates of Jerusalem. Now, when we have a look today to the gates of Jerusalem, are they still burning? No, they are not. The result was eternal. The fire burned as long as, as it used to. And then, when it has done for what it was sanded, then the fire quenched. So, in this case, the fire was an eternal fire. So, the punishment at the end is, in this case, an eternal punishment, because the result is an eternal thing. In early writings 290, it says, After all those whom he had deceived had perished, Satan was still to live and suffer on much longer. So here it's very clear. The people have perished. So they are gone. They do not live for eternity. They were tormented and they died. But now the Satan, he suffered longer. Why? Of course, he was the one who deceived all of them, men as well as angels. And so he will be the last one to die there. But he will not have eternal life in pain. He will die also. It says here in Ezekiel 28, verse 18 and 19, You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth, in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the peoples are astonished at you. You have become a horror, and shall be no more forever. This is the death of Satan. So everybody has seen him because he was placed right there on the earth. He couldn't leave this planet and then the fire came and the fire destroyed everything and he was the last one to die on the planet. And now everything is over. I mean, sin and sinners are consumed. Can it be 
that sin will come up again on earth? What will the future bring? I mean, when sin was there in the past, can it be that it will come up again? Well, in Nahum 1, verse 9, it says, What do you conspire against the Lord? He will make an utter end of it. Affliction will not rise up a second time. So it will never come up again. The time of sin is over. The sin and the sinners are no more. In heaven, there will be no sin anymore. And it says in early writings 45, the same fire from God that consumes the wicked purified the whole earth. The broken, ragged mountains melted with fervent heat, the atmosphere also, and all the stubble was consumed. Then our inheritance opened before us, glorious and beautiful, and we inherit the whole earth made new. We all shouted with a loud voice, glory, hallelujah. So the fire that have consumed the wicked now, the sin and the sinners on earth, the fire was to purify the world. So the world is now new. Everything that was wicked and evil is gone now, consumed by fire. And there is now the world laying before, now in ashes. And the people, they can see it. And it says here in the Great Controversy on 678, the great controversy is ended. Sin and sinners are no more. The entire universe is clean. One pulse of harmony and gladness beats through the vast creation. From him who created all flow life and light and gladness throughout the realms of illimitable space. From the minutest atom to the greatest world, all things animate and inanimate in their unshadowed beauty and perfect joy declare that God is love. So now we have made it to the point where sin is no more. So we have started in the, in the time when the church was shaking and we have seen how it goes on and how we went to the small time of trouble, the great time of trouble, even Jacob's trouble, and then the second coming the millennium, the thousand years, and the judgment of the wicked. And then we have seen the punishment, and then we have seen the purification of the earth. Sin and sinners are no more. The great controversy finally is over. And this is what we are longing for. The new world will be given by God. Sin is no more, and it will never come up again. And I really want you to be with me in this new world that Jesus will give to us, a world without sin, a world without evil, nothing wicked there. And this is a place for inheritance for you and me. And if you want to be there together with me and all the saints, I want to ask you to let, bring it in a prayer to our Lord Jesus Christ, that he might purify and prepare our hearts for this very moment, that our hearts may be pure and not evil, that it may not be destroyed in the last events. So let us pray that God will change our hearts. Our dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much that you have given us all the prophetic outline of the events of the last days. And Father, as we have seen that the world will be purified once, we want to ask you to purify our hearts today that our hearts may stand in the very last events that we will face. Please come into our hearts and please turn our hearts into a temple of the Holy Spirit that we might be seen as your people. And Father, thank you that you have already started this work in us. Please fulfill your word until we will see you coming in your glory. Amen. Well, we, are come, we have come to a point, we reached the point where we can say sin is no more. But what will we do in heaven? How will it go on? I mean, how will life be in heaven? Be invited to join the very 
last presentation in this series and our time of the end series when we speak about the events of the last days and we will now come to the last presentation in heaven, life in heaven and what it will be.